Hey, how's it going, oceanography class? Let's go over chapter seven, ocean circulation. So there's two types of ocean currents. There are surface currents and there are deep ocean currents. Surface currents, as it states there, is on the surface. Those are driven by the global wind belts. And so those are really affected by the prevailing winds that we talked about in chapter six, air-sea interaction. It's mostly a horizontal motion, just the wind kind of transferring its energy on the surface of the ocean and pushing it in different latitudes. Deep currents are the other type of ocean current, and those aren't driven by motion of air. They're really driven by the differences in density from different water masses. Um, and those density differences are, are driven by temperature, colder or warmer waters, or differences in salinity. And what happens with deep currents is that those are uh, not only horizontal motions, so you can have uh, beneath the surface masses of ocean water kind of moving horizontally, but they can also move vertically up and down as a result of those density differences. So how do we know this? Well, scientists have been measuring ocean surface currents for a long time. There are direct and indirect methods. Direct methods include putting devices out in the water, floating devices and tracking that information through time. Uh, sometimes they kind of float with the current and then transmit that information uh, to computers and stuff like that. Um, here's a drift current meter. Okay, so it floats along the ocean surface. Um, others are fixed perhaps uh, in, in areas where um, they can be anchored to the ocean floor or they can be kind of controlled to just hover at certain depths like you see here. This is um, a propeller type flow meter. Okay. Um, indirect methods, the way this is done is through essentially meteorology, understanding the different pressure gradients that exist, high and low pressure, uh, systems uh, in the atmosphere over the ocean can help determine um, the direction of ocean currents. Uh, we also use radar altimeters and Doppler flow meters. This is a satellite image of the ocean surface and the kind of um, changing ocean surface. So when you think of the ocean, if you've ever been out there, most people have probably been into coastal waters. Few people have actually out, you know, been out into the open ocean. Um, but the ocean isn't just level, okay? Over large distances, there are changes in the topology of the ocean surface. If you look at this image, the colors represent sea surface height above and below the kind of theoretical average of where sea surface should be. This is measured uh, via satellites, okay? So areas uh, where you, you see, you know, colored red, which would be kind of like all in these areas here, these areas are between 40 and approximately 80 centimeters above the sea surface average. So they're higher. So essentially like they're hills, you know what I mean? Like just very gradual hills. And, and when you're, if you were um, on a boat leaving on the Pacific side of Mexico going in this direction, your boat would be essentially kind of going uphill. Now that's a very far distance, but it's essentially just saying that the ocean surface isn't flat. Areas that are blue are where areas that are lower um, than the average surface height, sea surface height. Okay, between 80 and 120 centimeters would be kind of this area here in the North Atlantic. Okay, so there are really high areas of uh, the ocean surface. Over here would be a really large hill in our uh, North Atlantic. This area just um, east of Florida is kind of the highest point of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and then the Southern Atlantic closer to uh, the coasts of uh, of, um, of Brazil, you would see these highs in sea surface height. Okay, so we have a very dynamic ocean topography. 
We can also measure deep ocean currents uh, via chemical tracers. Um, tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. And so hydrogen is part of the water molecule, right, H2O. Um, and so hydrogen has um, uh, variations of itself, uh, tritium being one of those. Tritium uh, is created in the upper atmosphere uh, in very small amounts, okay, um, in comparison to how much normal hydrogen there is. So that isotope, tritium, um, is created by interaction with cosmic rays. Uh, then it can be included into water vapor, eventually precipitate, be part of the ocean. And then you can essentially measure um, the tritium in ocean water and use that as a chemical tracer because it has a half-life. Um, and you can compare that to surface waters and um, atmospheric tritium. So uh, that's a useful way of, of tracking how um, water moves through the kind of deeper currents in the ocean. Uh, also, sadly, um, a lot of uh, contaminants can be used to measure ocean currents as well. Chlorofluorocarbons are a contaminant that can be used. Uh, other things, um, other isotopes, especially radioactive isotopes after uh, blowing up of nuclear bombs have been kind of uh, in, the, in the past and continually are being used to, to track those radioactive, radioactive isotopes um, in the water itself. But um, deep ocean currents uh, are, are characterized by their temperature and salinity. And we can come up with a bunch of different um, uh, masses of ocean water that have distinct temperature and salinity um, characteristics. Argo is this project uh, where there's this array of floats that are all over the, the ocean. Uh, that m measures ocean temperature, salinity, pH. Um, and every one of these black dots are one of these devices out in the ocean. This is from uh, October 26, 2015. So there were about 3,918 floats. And essentially um, what they do uh, is they can be on the surface, but they can also dive down to uh, about a depth of three kilometers. Oh, I'm sorry, two kilometers, so about 6,600 feet. Um, so they can be on the surface and go as deep as two kilometers. And so uh, the purpose of this was is to uh, collect data at varying depths of the ocean. Um, and they kind of sit there for a few days, maybe a couple weeks, and then they float back up to the surface, pop back up, and then that signal is transmitted to um, scientists and it transmits all that data so that they can kind of track deep ocean currents and surface currents. So this was a huge project. And it's important because oceanographers were able to develop forecasting systems for the ocean uh, and weather forecasts for different parts uh, of the ocean basin and how it affects uh, the land areas uh, and track human-caused climate change over the past few decades. So this project has, has really um, given uh, scientists a lot of data and understanding of uh, how our ocean mass transfer occurs. Presently, the Argo program has um, about 25 deep water uh, ve vessels or floats, uh, and they can make it down to about 6,000 meters, so almost three times as deep as the uh, initial project, and that allows oceanographers to look at deep ocean currents that are six kilometers deep, record the pH temperature, a bunch of other different variables, and understand how our, our global ocean system kind of circulates and if there are any changes that are occurring. So surface currents are all the waters that are that occur above the peak decline. Remember, that's that area of rapidly changing temperature and density. That's only about 10% of the ocean water, okay? And, and the way friction currents are initiated and are pushed and are kind of continuous is because of the friction between uh, the global wind belts and the ocean surface. 
And what happens is uh, as the global wind belts and prevailing winds blow across the ocean surface, 2% of that energy because of air mass movement is transferred directly to the water. And so the surface currents of the ocean move as a result of that air kind of moving above it. Uh, and they move slower than the wind, of course. Okay, And so it's kind of like if you hold your cup of coffee in the morning and it's a little too hot, and so you blow on the surface of that, you're creating these tiny little ripples on the surface of your coffee. That Those are surface currents in your coffee. That's how it works on the open ocean surface. And so what this means is that uh, the surface currents, the ocean surface currents generally follow the Earth's wind belt pattern. And that's why we talk about air-sea interaction before ocean circulation. So here we go. See these green lines here? These are the prevailing winds as a result of uh, atmospheric circulation. Remember, these are the trade winds, okay? Uh, and they blow from the east towards the west, and you see that they kind of curve because of that Coriolis effect, okay? Then up here we have the westerlies at a higher latitude, and they blow from the west to east. And again, in the northern hemisphere, they are deflected to the right, or appear to be deflected to the right. Um, and, and so these are the prevailing winds. And so what that does is that those prevailing wind belts push the surface of the ocean here, okay, closer to the equator, and all this ocean water kind of moves in this direction, okay? And um, our Earth has kind of major, I guess, barriers to the ocean water, our giant continents. Um, so all this water that's close to the tropics that moves in this direction um, will kind of be forced to kind of move upwards because of the land masses, but also ocean water is also affected by the Coriolis effect. So if you have ocean water moving this direction. Yeah, I'll use new colors now. Um, that ocean water will be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and then go northward, right? And as that ocean water moves northward, um, then it starts interacting with the westerlies. And then it, gets, it starts being pushed towards the east, you see? Um, and so, and as it's pushed towards the east, again, it's affected by the Coriolis effect, and then again, running into a major landmass, it curves to the right and then starts to go south, and then completes this loop. So you see that loop that I just that I've just drawn. Uh, we call that a subpolar uh, gyre. Okay, and these this kind of encompasses the major mass movement of uh, ocean water at these latitudes. Okay, in the South Atlantic, the same thing occurs. Here are the um, southeastern trade winds. They blow uh, waters that are close to the equator uh, to the west. Okay, um, the Coriolis effect uh, uh, makes these water masses deflect to the left because they're in the southern hemisphere, so these go southward. And then the southern hemisphere um, uh, westerlies blow in this direction, okay, so it pushes that water now to the east, and then it deflects to the left because of the Coriolis effect, and then goes north and completes the South Atlantic gyre. Okay, so the surface currents that are generated and being pushed by um, the atmosphere are influenced by uh, the distribution of continents because ocean water will kind of move in a certain direction, and if there's a big barrier in the way, they're going to be affected by that. They're going to turn. Other things that influence surface currents um, are gravity, friction, and as I mentioned uh, before, the Coriolis effect. And that depends. The Coriolis effect uh, depends on which hemisphere you're in. And so what these uh, surface currents create are gyres, as what I mentioned before. Those are large circular loops of moving water in the ocean basin. Okay, um, and for a complete loop, depending on the, the the size of the gyre and which gyre we're talking about, it could be anywhere between three years uh, to six to eight years to make a, a complete loop. Okay, some of the bigger gyres take longer. Uh, the ones I mentioned, the North and South Atlantic, those are subtropical gyres. 
And the reason why they're called subtropical is because they're centered at 30 degrees latitude. Remember, 30 degrees latitude are those horse latitudes where you have a lot of descending dry air from the upper atmosphere. So these subtropical gyres, these uh, giant circular currents, if you consider them uh, in their totality, they're bounded by um, uh, four major currents. There's an equatorial current, which would be here. Okay. Then there's a western boundary current, which is on this side of the gyre. There's a northern boundary, which is up here, or southern, which would be down here, because if, if we're talking about the southern hemisphere, let me draw that gyre down here, just make it a little less confusing. Okay, and then there's the eastern boundary currents, which are on this side. Remember, north, east, south, west. Okay, so these are just the bounds of each one of the dryers. So, gyre. So these are the four currents that uh, kind of encompass the entire gyre. So um, there, you know, on Earth, there are five major subtropical gyres. Uh, we talked about the uh, North Atlantic gyre, which is called the Columbus gyre. Um, there's the South Atlantic gyre, which is called the Navigator gyre. Then there's a North Pacific, there's a South Pacific, and then in the Indian Ocean, there's only one major subtropical gyre. Here's a picture of them all. Okay, so here is the North Pacific, South Pacific. Remember, these are the subtropical, so 30 degrees south latitude is kind of the center of that uh, ocean circulation, right? So 30 degrees north latitude. Here is 30 degrees north, and here's the North Atlantic gyre, and here's the South Atlantic gyre. Again, 30 degrees at the middle of the gyre. And then here's the Indian Ocean subtropical gyre. Now, the, there are other... Uh, gyres, but they, they're uh, much smaller. Here's the subpolar one up here at a higher latitude. Okay, um, And then there can be ones at higher latitudes in the southern hemisphere over here. Okay, And then every single one of these is bounded by those four currents. Okay, uh, Here on this image, they're kind of color-coded. Um, red denotes their temperature. So these equatorial currents that you see here, these are very warm. These are very warm, warm currents, currents, which makes sense because they're closer to the equator. They receive the most solar radiation. Okay, and then those north, uh, those equatorial currents are pushed by the trade winds, and they generally move uh, to the west. Okay, uh, then in the northern hemisphere they turn northward because of the Coriolis effect and barriers in their way. In the southern hemisphere they turn to the left and go southward. Notice how these are still red currents, okay? Um, this is the western side of the ocean basin, so we refer to these as western boundary currents, okay? So this is an example of one. The, the East Australian current is a western boundary current. The Koshiro current off the coast of Japan is a western boundary current, okay? And then as those western boundary currents kind of go northward, they move into higher latitudes and to cooler waters and they receive less solar radiation they kind of cool down all right so this is the kind of northern part of the ocean gyre and then they get deflected to the right and again they're pushed by the westerly winds right westerly winds are in this direction and the trade winds are in that direction um, and then they cool down so these um, these currents cool down and you see it turns into a new current Here's the California current, and it's in blue. That means it's colder, so it's a very cold current. The southern hemisphere, the South Pacific gyre, this is the Peru current, and again, it's blue because it's very cold. In our Atlantic Ocean, here are the western boundary currents here, and here's the western boundary current. Warm water from the tropics kind of moves northward, becomes part of the western boundary current, the Gulf Stream, and then this moves across the North Atlantic, hits Europe, turns southward and becomes a canary current, and this is a very cold current. These are eastern boundary currents because they're on the eastern boundary of the ocean basin. So again, here's the eastern boundary, okay? And then this is the uh, eastern boundary current of the South Atlantic tropical, subtropical gyre. Here's the western boundary moving southward, and then that completes the gyre here, okay? So those are the subtropical gyres and their currents. 
Notice that the western boundary currents are typically found on the eastern side of continents. It can be very confusing, but as oceanographers, we refer to, um, let's say, if when we're talking about eastern and western boundary currents, we're talking about this here is the Pacific Ocean Basin. So this would be the western side of the Pacific Ocean Basin. This would be the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean Basin. Okay. Um, and then when we talk about continents, obviously, uh, this is the western side of the American continent, and this would be the uh, eastern side of the Asian continent. So it can be a little confusing, but no, just know what we're talking about, either the continent or the ocean basin. So equatorial currents, uh, as their name suggests, they're close to the uh, equator. Okay, um, you either find them on a north or southern side of gyres, and they travel westward along the equator, and that's because they're being pushed by the trade winds. Western boundary currents, these are those really warm currents that originate from equatorial regions. So this water has been under the sun, receiving a lot of solar radiation, very warm, low density water, kind of moving on the eastern side of continents or the western side of ocean basins. Okay, then there are northern or southern boundary currents, depending on which hemisphere you're in, and that's easterly water flow across an ocean basin. So it's the northern boundary of the gyre in the northern hemisphere and the southern boundary in the southern hemisphere. Then there are eastern boundary currents. These are very cold waters. These are cold waters because they originate from really high latitudes, and if you're uh, a water mass at high latitudes in on Earth, um, you don't receive a lot of solar radiation. Um, you have a lot of cool air masses kind of moving above you, so you're cold. So those are very cool waters. And they flow uh, southward in the northern hemisphere and northward in the southern hemisphere. And they move along the eastern edge of ocean basins or on the west side of continents. Okay, that's why, like, if you've ever been to uh, California, for example, um, or let's just say Chile, which I doubt many people have been to Chile, but if you get into the ocean water at those areas, if you're a surfer, you have to wear uh, a wetsuit because it's so cold. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are from Florida. Um, when you get in the water, the water is really warm. Um, you don't need a wetsuit, and that's because in Florida, we're on the eastern side of a continent or the western side of the Atlantic Ocean Basin, and so we get a lot of warm water from the uh, equatorial regions kind of moving northward along our coastline. Okay. Now, there are also equatorial countercurrents, so these move in the opposite direction, eastward, eastward flow, um, and uh, they don't really have a curve to them because since they're at the equator, um, the Coriolis effect has no uh, effect on them. And so what happens, the reason why there are equatorial countercurrents is because um, remember how the ocean surface is not flat and it's not equal? Uh, on the western sides of ocean basins, because of the Earth's rotation, those typically have uh, the high points of the subtropical um, uh, gyres. Um, so the, essentially they're just... Uh, high standing hills that can be as much as six meters higher than the uh, water on the other side of the basin. So because of that height difference, gravity makes the water kind of flow back to the low lying areas and those are the counter currents. And as I mentioned before, there are subpolar gyres and they rotate in the opposite direction and uh, they're much smaller and they rotate in the opposite direction because they're influenced by the westerlies on the southern end of it and then the polar easterlies on the northern part of that. So that's why they flow in the opposite direction. Here's a nice table to show you all the different gyres, North Pacific, South Pacific, um, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Indian Ocean. Okay, and then uh, here are all the currents associated with each one of those gyres. So it's a, it's a cool reference slide to go back and forth when you wanna know uh, specifically about a boundary current, a surface boundary current. Okay, so a lot of people who have been out in the open ocean, way away from coastal waters, 
um, have reported this kind of phenomenon, and it's and it's been reported for a while, known for a while, um, that if you have prevailing winds, like you see here, there's a prevailing wind in this direction. A lot of people on ships notice that uh, when you have objects floating in water, like icebergs, um, or a ship, let's just say it's uh, on sails and it's just being pushed by the wind, um, it doesn't. These objects floating in the water don't move perfectly with the wind in the same direction of the wind. In fact, they move about uh, just less than 40 degrees in this direction. And that puzzled a lot of early navigators in the open ocean is why? Why do icebergs that are floating in the water, uh, why don't they just drift completely northward? Why are they going off in this direction? And the reason for that is uh, a phenomenon we refer to as the Ekman spiral. Ekman is a was a Norwegian scientist who came up with, uh, he was a physicist who came up with the explanation of this. And we call it essentially Ekman transport. And so what happens is the, the phenomenon, if you're in the northern hemisphere, um, uh, objects that are floating in the open ocean will move 20 to 40 degrees to the right of the wing, of the wind. So here, that difference is 20 to 40 degrees to the right of the prevailing wind direction. In the southern hemisphere, it changes because of the Coriolis effect to the left of the wind. And so the reason for this, so Walfred Ekman was able to explain this, is that you have to think of ocean, uh, of water in the ocean as like kind of distinct layers as you go deeper and deeper. So as wind blows across the surface of the ocean, it it skims the surface water in the direction of the wind, right? And so because of uh, the Coriolis effect, that water is gonna kind of, um, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, be deflected slightly to the right. So much of that surface water is gonna move in this direction, okay? Now what happens is the water below that, think of it as a, another distinct layer, okay? that water is only interacting with the water above it and that water is moving in this direction. So this water is gonna move uh, to a certain degree to the right of the upper layer of water. So it's kind of moving in that direction. And then the water layer below that is gonna move slightly to the right of the layer above it and so forth. The arrows get smaller and smaller because the force of friction acting upon the lower and lower areas diminishes the deeper and deeper you go. And ultimately, what's crazy is that uh, a small amount of energy pushes water at this depth just about 100 meters. Once you go beyond 100 meters, this water is unaffected by the wind blowing, okay? But this water, because of this phenomenon, this water down here actually moves in the opposite direction uh, of the initial wind blowing in, in this direction, which is pretty crazy. Um, so what this does is it creates a spiral. Imagine holding a deck of cards and then kind of flaying them out and then all the cards kind of point in a different direction, kind of creating a spiral. Um, let me just, I guess I can just kind of draw that for you. But essentially what you're drawing here is a spiral, right? So like that, okay, <laughs> terrible artist. But anyways, uh, the, this really explains the balance between friction between different water levels and the Coriolis effect, okay? Uh, and if you add up all these forces to the different layers of water, the take home message is the direction of Ekman transport is roughly about 90 degrees from the direction of the wind, okay? So the net transport of water as a result of interaction with surface wind is that it's gonna move 90 degrees to the right of the wind in the Northern hemisphere and in the Southern hemisphere, 90 degrees to the left. Okay, so here's just a reiteration of that prevailing wind direction. This is a spiral with deeper and deeper water layers moving in different directions as a result of friction with other layers and the Coriolis effect. And then the net result is water actually moves counterintuitively 90 degrees to the right of the wind direction in the Northern hemisphere. Okay, so that Ekman transport along with um, uh, the Coriolis effect is what creates that rotational flow in an ocean basin, and that's why we have those gyres. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, what we call, what we refer to as subtropical convergence. 
and this is where we have a lot of water piling up um, in the middle of the gyre. And that's what causes those kind of high points on the ocean surface. So maybe here's a low point on the um, eastern side of an ocean basin, and on the western side you have, and this is greatly exaggerated, but this would be the higher points of sea surface. Uh, so this would be, it can be as much as six meter, or I'm sorry, six feet higher in elevation when comparing the two the two spots. Okay, so here are those kind of big um, giant hills of water, so to speak. Um, and this creates a new type of a current called a geostrophic current. So what happens is when surface waters kind of um, flow along these uh, undulating surfaces on the ocean floor, um, we have kind of a battle of two different forces, right? So let's pretend this is sea surface and this represents kind of a lens here, of higher and lower water, a hill of water, so to speak. Um, and say you have, you have water sitting like right here, right? And it's moving this direction because it's being, this is the Northern hemisphere, so it's being blown by the, the trade winds uh, to the West. Um, there are two forces here in the Northern hemisphere um, this water wants to, because of Ekman transport and the Coriolis effect, wants to be deflected to the right. But at the same time, because it's moving along a hill, uh, gravity is kind of pulling it down. So these two forces kind of uh, fight with each other, and then the actual flow of the water is in this direction in response to gravity and the Coriolis effect. Okay, so this is kind of like a cross-section uh, of uh, these higher areas. This is the north northern hemisphere subtropical gyre. Okay, so geostrophic currents are a balance of the Coriolis effect and gravitational forces being acted upon a moving mass of surface ocean water. And so what happens is the ocean water moves in a curved path downhill around uh, these subtropical gyres. So this is a bird eye, bird's eye view of one, okay? Uh, and this is I idealistic geostrophic flow. So there are a, little, a lot of other factors in play, um, what the atmospheric situation is, if there are waves moving through, if there's a high or low pressure system, um, and also if there are land masses involved. But here's a bird's eye view, okay, of, um, uh, of the center of a subtropical gyre, okay? So here's the rotational center. These green arrows are the prevailing winds, okay? So here, again, and we're on the northern hemisphere. This is the eastern side of the ocean basin. Here's the western side. So the rotational center of the gyre is pushed over to the western side because of the rotation of the earth, okay? So those green arrows indicate the prevailing winds. These are the westerlies, okay? These are the trade winds. And so what happens is as water is moving um, because being pushed from lower latitude areas towards the west, they approach um, this high point in the gyre and kind of move around it, okay? And if you notice on the western side, on the western side of an ocean gyre, see these lines are very close together, okay? That means that the elevation here is changing very rapidly, okay? So if you were to travel from let's say here to here, okay, you're going uphill and you're going uphill pretty quickly, okay? Uh, if you're on the, the eastern side of the ocean basin and you were traveling from here to here, this is a more gradual change in the height of the ocean surface. So, the, so what happens here is that these, these geostrophic currents that are kind of rotating around the subtropical gyre, they intensify and their velocities increase on the western side of uh, a subtropical ocean um, gyre because um, the force of gravity works on these currents and kind of funnels them on one side of the hill, right? Like if you think of a hill and water flowing on a hill, if you have a very steep hill, the water velocity is gonna flow much faster. If you have um, a gently sloping hill, you're gonna have slower moving water. So the same thing is here. So currents currents on the western side of a subtropical gyre, their velocities are much faster. Uh, when water is kind of moving southward in this direction and on the eastern side of a gyre, their velocities are much slower because uh, the slope 
um, difference. It's a lot spread out, uh, and there's a gradual change in the surface height of the ocean here. Okay, so essentially, um, the top of that hill of water that we've been talking about is pushed out west, and that's because of the counterclockwise rotation of our Earth. Okay, and so western boundary currents are intensified as a result. So that means that the water that flows on the western boundary or on the western sides of ocean basins flows faster, higher velocities. Um, they're also narrower, okay? So they're more like, think of them as like fast-flowing rivers. And the water is, uh, the water that, it, that are a part of these currents are much deeper. And also because they originate uh, from the tropics, they're also much warmer. Okay, so th you know the combination of the of the the gravity as well as the Coriolis effect contributes to what we refer to as Western intensification, and that is the intensification of ocean currents on the western side of ocean basins, as a result of all these factors. Um, and just to show you a cross section of what I was talking about, here are Western boundary currents. Okay, one the best example of this and the fastest moving. Uh, a boundary, western boundary current on Earth is the Gulf Stream. Okay, um, they're very narrow. Okay, uh, and but the velocity is very high. Okay, this is the top of the hill. This is a cross section, right? So this is the the middle of a subtropical gyre. The water in a western boundary current, the water that's moving here, um, is very warm and is very deep. See how it it, it kind of if we were looking at a cross section from the ocean surface down a little deeper, this includes the entire current. So all of this water is moving as a result of that western intensification. Very fast velocity, very narrow as a current, uh, and very warm water. Now on the other side of an ocean basin, the eastern side of ocean basin, we have eastern boundary currents. Okay, They have the opposite properties of western boundary currents. They're very cold okay, because their water is originating from higher latitudes. They're very slow, so very low velocity, and they're very shallow, okay, and they're very wide. So here we go. Here's an eastern boundary current. Um, here the slope is very gradual in comparison to the other side of the ocean basin. Um, and here's uh, an example of the Canary Current. This is off the coast of Spain and Portugal, okay, that moves in a, a kind of southern uh, direction in the North Atlantic and is a very slow-moving, broad uh, shallow and very cold and weak current as a result. So here, this is a good way to compare both western and eastern boundary currents. Okay, western boundary currents, again, western parts of the ocean basin. We've got the Gulf Stream, which we talked about. Um, they're very narrow, less than 60 miles wide. Okay, um, the Brazil Current and also the Kashira current off the coast of Japan. Those are all western boundary currents. They're deep. They can The water that moves in these currents can be as deep as 1.2 kilometers. They're fast, hundreds of kilometers per day. Um, uh, a spur drop is a measurement of flow rate. So um, a lot of water flows through western boundary currents, as much as 100 spur drops. Okay. Those are millions of cubic centimeters of ocean water per second. Okay, and then eastern boundary currents like the uh, Canary Current we just talked about, the Benguela Current off the coast of Africa, and the California Current, um, those are very wide. They can be over 600 miles wide or 1,000 kilometers. Very shallow, the water that's part of this current only goes down to about 0.3 miles, um, and they're very slow. Okay, so that's the major difference between eastern and western boundary currents. So just to sum it up, uh, western boundary currents are typically very warm, and as a result of that, they influence the climate on the eastern side of continents. So those wo warm ocean currents, uh, they warm up the air on the coastline. So warm and humid air inundates the eastern boundaries of continents. Okay, That's why it's so humid uh, and hot on the eastern side of the United States, especially during the summer. Um, if you're next to, or if you're on the western side of a continent, which is the eastern side of an ocean basin, then you have very cool ocean currents 
at the coastline. Like California, you have very cool and dry air, and that creates dry climates, okay? And those land masses are typically dry. So Southern California, very, very dry. Okay, so this is how ocean currents affect uh, the local climate, okay? So typically, here's a western boundary current. A lot of warm weather here as a result of all that tropical water moving northward, okay? Same thing goes with uh, this area of Brazil. Lots of warm water from the tropics moving in this direction. Uh, eastern boundary currents, so that's water originating, originating from high latitudes moving southward. Uh, if you've ever been to coastlines in this part of the um, either African or Portugal or Spain, the water's freezing. It's so cold. Okay, same thing with California uh, and parts of northern Mexico. Uh, the California current moves from high latitudes southward, right? And then same thing for Chile, Peru. Uh, that's very cold water and very cold ocean side of an ocean basin. And if you're in Australia or uh, any of the Pacific Islands over here, very warm water typically, and that's because of the Koshiro Current. And in Australia, here's the East um, uh, Pacific Current here, East Australian Current, I'm sorry, West Australian Current here. Okay. There are two terms, upwelling and downwelling. I think I've mentioned them before, but upwelling is the vertical movement of ocean water, so cold ocean water from depth moving upwards towards the surface, and that's typically nutrient-rich. And the reason why that's important is because those nutrients um, uh, feed the kind of uh, the bottom of the food chain, right? Those um, uh, photosynthesizing single-celled algae that live in the ocean, which feed the zooplankton, and the zooplankton are eaten by smaller fish, and then a cascade of life that occurs as a result of those algal blooms um, is the result of upwelling, okay? We call that um, high biological productivity. That's an abundance of algae, and algae, they're the base of the food web, and so all the other organisms come in uh, when there's a, a never-ending buffet of food that's occurring in the ocean. And that occurs in areas where there's upwelling, vertical movement of nutrient-rich cold water. Downwelling is the opposite. That is the vertical movement of surface water downward in the water column. And in those areas, um, those are typically nutrient-poor waters, so you don't see a lot of uh, biological activity. Where this occurs, this occurs in a number of different areas and situations. One place is at directly on the equator at zero degrees latitude. Because like north of the equator, we've got the trade winds blowing in like this, right? And then south of the equator, we have the uh, southeastern trade winds blowing in this direction. Because those ocean waters uh, turn to the left in the southern hemisphere and to the right in the northern hemisphere, that causes divergence. And the surface waters diverge away uh, from the equator when that happens. So think of yourself in a bathtub and you're just using your arm to skim the surface of the water away. So if you're skimming that water and pushing it away, deeper water uh, from the bottom of the tub will rise to the top, to the surface. And so that's upwelling. So deeper water down here at the equator will rise to the surface and that leads to an abundance of uh, marine activity, especially at the, uh, uh, at the equator. So we call this equatorial upwelling. Okay. And that results in high productivity. When we have converging surface water, that's when surface water moves towards each other and water piles up and you get a big dome of water. Well, because of that weight and gravity, that will pull water downwards. And that's when we have uh, downwelling. And that's typically where we have low biological activity. And so this can also happen on coastlines. And that's why certain coastlines are very uh, um, rich areas for fishing. Um, and the reason is because coastal winds or prevailing winds um, will push water uh, in a certain direction and force deep nutrient water to the surface. Um, and so that Ekman transport will move seawater away from the shore. The cold nutrient rich water will come up to the surface. Um, and that happens on the western United States and in places in San Francisco as an example. So uh, that would be coastal upwelling. But coastal downwelling is also, uh, could also, can also occur depending 
uh, on the different variables. Okay, so water will pile up uh, closer to the coast, causing water to sink downwards, and that what that causes is a lack of productivity and marine life. So here are those two situations. If we have wind kind of moving in the southern direction on the west coast of North America, okay, this is in the uh, northern hemisphere, okay, so that means that the water will be deflected to the right, and so all this surface water is moving away from the coast, and so what that causes is that if you're moving the surface water away from the coastline, deeper water will come up to replace it, and that's nutrient rich and cold, and then you have abundant life. So here's, this would be an example of upwelling. But if you're on the same western coast, right, and you have a northerly wind, uh, the surface water will be deflected to the right and move towards the coastline, and this will cause downwelling. So you can see that in both cases here. You can have other causes to upwelling. Um, you can have offshore winds depending on uh, different seasons that form. Monsoon winds are an example uh, of that. So offshore winds will move off the land and push the surface water away, causing upwelling. Okay. Uh, you can have variations in seafloor, like a table mount or um, uh, underwater, uh, like a, a an, an, an atoll or sea island or any type of uh, a volcanic feature on the ocean floor. Um, and that can force uh, deep ocean waters as it interacts with that um, land mass, it pushes it upwards, and then you have a lot of marine life here. Uh, and another one would be just the shape of the coastline, right? So if the predominant wind direction um, is moving, in, or the, the ocean current, excuse me, is moving in this direction, uh, what that means is that water that sits right here moves southward, right? Uh, and that will cause deeper waters to rise. So this would be a great fishing spot because there'd be a lot of upwelling here. So the shape of the land and the coastline affects um, uh, where you'd find nutrient-rich waters on the surface or where there are uh, where there's upwelling. All right, so let's talk about um, ocean circulation in specific regions. Um, let's let's talk about Antarctic circulation. This this area is very unique. Um, we're looking at um, the southern hemisphere like as if we're kind of underneath Earth, but what is underneath Earth when you're in space? We're just looking at uh, the southern hemisphere here, and here's Antarctica, here's South America, here's Africa. Um, so here, uh, the, the way the ocean circulates in this part of the Earth, um, we have really prevailing westerlies, so the, let's put that in green, we have the westerlies blowing um, essentially unimpeded all around uh, this latitude. But, you know, between the, f the 40 degrees to 60 degrees, uh, we have um, westerlies kind of pushing in this direction. So that pushes the ocean currents uh, in this direction. And remember, these are all at, um, southerly waters, ocean waters that are part of the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Oceans, okay? Um, we call this the west wind drift, okay? Um, and this is uh, unimpeded wind that, that uh, blows um, in this direction as a result of ocean circu um, uh, atmospheric circulation. But what's interesting here is that there really there aren't many land masses that come into contact um, with this ocean water. So this ocean water is essentially unimpeded as it kind of s like s circumnavigates you know the earth. It's just kind of, um, just moves, just continually moves and, and picks up speed. Um, it's the only one to encircle the Earth. And it moves more water than any other current. Okay. And w what happens here, um, and, it, and it varies depending on season, uh, but basically from 40 to 6 degrees south uh, latitude, you have really fast uh, uh, prevailing winds here, and that causes the ocean water to move very quickly. But um, what ends up happening over here, if you go further or closer to the uh, southern pole, is that here you have the east uh, wind drift or the polar easterlies. So that is a prevailing wind that blows in the opposite direction. This is a little closer uh, to the polar highs and um, closer to the Antarctic continent. So the wind direction changes and it moves and it 
kind of blows in the opposite direction. So what that does is if you have two ocean currents, here's the east wind drift current closer to the Antarctic coastline, um, that causes uh, divergence in this area, okay? And that causes a lot of upwelling uh, that's part of um, the Antarctic convergence here. And there's a, an abundance of marine life that occurs in between these two major currents. Okay, that's the Antarctic convergence. So cold, dense Antarctic waters that are close to Antarctica, they converge with that warmer water, waters from the kind of being pushed by the, by the westerlies. Um, and uh, they're less dense than those sub-Antarctic waters. So there's some sinking water that occurs there. Um, and it's the result of this east wind drift. These polar easterlies uh, push, in, push that water that's closer to the Antarctic um, in the opposite direction. So it causes that um, Antarctic divergence. And that's where you see that abundant marine life. Okay. So that surface divergence uh, causes the abundant marine life because it causes uh, upwelling in, in kind of the open ocean there. All right, if we go to the Atlantic circulation, here's a, a kind of a close-up look of that. Here's the Gulf Stream. Okay, a lot of these uh, waters come from the tropics, move in this direction. Some, some of those waters kind of move in and go into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but uh, a lot of them become part of the Florida current, which is between Cuba and Florida, and then become part of the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream, right off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, kind of cuts across the North Atlantic. The Labrador current kind of comes southward and collides there a little bit. Those are colder currents, but then uh, the Gulf Stream kind of cuts across uh, the Atlantic here, and it delivers a lot of heat to northern Europe, okay? And then a lot of these waters become part of the Canary Current, and that completes the uh, North Atlantic um, uh, uh, subtropical gyre, okay? And these are all the currents associated with uh, the North Atlantic subtropical gyre. You can see the, the directions here. Now, there's some variation as well. The South Atlantic, um, uh, here are the currents associated with it. Red is warm. Here's the western boundary current. That's the um, uh, Brazil current. Here is the cooler eastern boundary current called the Benguala current. And then you have the south. Um, uh, the, here's the Ant Antarctic circumpolar current, right? I showed you last time moving in this direction. Okay. Um, and... <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, moving in that direction. And then here on the northern side would be the uh, south equatorial current moving this direction. And that completes the South Atlantic subtropical gyre. The Gulf Stream itself is uh, a western boundary current that is the most studied of all ocean currents. Uh, it moves along the uh, east coast of the United States. It has meanders and loops, and it merges with the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is kind of like the center of the uh, North Atlantic subtropical gyre. Uh, it's named the Sargasso Sea because um, uh, it has this sargassum uh, algae that often uh, winds up washing up on the shores of the East Coast. Um, and, and it creates kind of like that unique uh, biology. Uh, but the reason why it's the most studied is because, well, it's closest to our coast, so we can get our vessels out there to study it. But it's the fastest moving western boundary uh, current. And the Gulf Stream moves so much water, um, the flow is about 100 sphere drops. And just to understand that volume of water, think of uh, your favorite sports team and filling up one of those sports stadiums with a lot of water. And so 100 major league sports stadiums passing by the southeastern United States, states each second, okay? Um, that's 100 times more water than all the um, combined flow of all the world's rivers. So that is a lot of water being intensified on the western side of, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And what happens is a lot of this water kind of offshoots and becomes part of these um, eddies that form, uh, and there are two different types of eddies, warm core ring eddies, which kind of uh, spin off into the Sargasso Sea, and essentially what this means is warm water from the Gulf Stream is trapped in this loop and kind of uh, flows out into the Sargasso Sea, but also the Labrador Current can kind of come in and get trapped 
surrounded by warm water. Um, and that uh, in those areas, which can be m miles in diameter, uh, can contain unique biological populations within those cores. So if we, if we take a look at a satellite image, uh, here where the colors indicate how warm the water is, here's the Gulf Stream and how warm it, it is and moving in this direction. Um, right off of Cape Hatteras, there's a Labrador current of cold water moving kind of southward here. Um, so these cold water uh, eddies can spin off into uh, their Sargasso Sea in this direction. But there are also warm water eddies over here that you see, okay? Um, so uh, they, can, they can harbor a lot of specific unique biology living in cold waters within this ring kind of spinning off into the Atlantic Ocean, which is pretty interesting. It also affects a lot of this, uh, the ocean floor sediment in those regions too. It can kind of disrupt it. Um, then there's the loop currents. These are uh, the warm o ocean in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So incoming uh, warm tropical waters can move into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and it creates these warm water eddies and cooler water eddies uh, within the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, the reason why this is important, because that means a lot of circulating warm water kind of stagnates here. And that's why a lot of times when we have low pressure systems move through the Gulf of Mexico, uh, they intensify because of all the looping warm water in this region. And that's why a lot of times Texas and Louisiana have to deal with like hurricanes that just can pop up in the Gulf of Mexico and then move northward. So the north moving warm currents of the Gulf Stream, it warms up the east coast of the United States. That's why, like if, you've <laughs> if you're in New York or if you're in Boston, all the way down to Florida, our summers are incredibly hot. And the reason is because we have a lot of heat coming from the tropics and all that heat being stored in the water, right? Stored in the ocean because of its high heat capacity. And that heat is transferred to those coastal regions. And that's why it's so hot uh, and, and uh, wet during the summer months on the east coast of the United States. And all that warmth travels across the Atlantic and affects uh, northern Europe, like the, the UK, uh, Norway, Sweden, those areas of northern Europe. They're at the same latitude as some of the northern latitudes of Canada. And if you go to the interior of Canada at, at equal latitudes to those northern European areas, those are frozen cold uh, tundra areas. So um, the, the climatic effects of the Gulf Stream really warm uh, northern Europe up and make their climate much milder than it should be at that latitude. And that's just the power of ocean currents transferring heat from uh, low latitudes like the equator to northern latitudes. If you have, um, uh, if you're on the western side of a continent or the eastern side of an ocean basin, then you'll have south moving currents and very cold water coming from higher latitudes moving southward. And that's why uh, the coast of San Francisco uh, the, uh, or those areas of uh, California are very cold or can be very cold. Uh, that's why the water is very cold, and that's why it's very dry, okay? Um, the Canary Current cools the North African coast, and the Labrador Current cools Eastern Canada. So the ocean has a direct effect on local climates, depending on, on where you are. If we go to the Indian Ocean, um, the circulation there is very interesting because they have something called the monsoons. Um, and this is a seasonal reversal of the prevailing wind direction, and that's over the Indian Ocean. And the reason for this is because of the difference between the heat capacity of the immense Asian continent and the Indian Ocean. So what happens is in uh, the wintertime, you have the northeastern monsoon, and then in the summertime, you have a southwestern monsoon. Let me show you an image to show you the different um, changes in uh, season. So in the winter months, okay, um, what happens is the monsoon winds blow from uh, the large Asian continent in this direction, right, deflected to the right because of the northern hemisphere. Um, and the reason they do this is because in the wintertime, it's so cold. It's so cold on land that um, the low heat capacity of land cools down uh, the the air masses that sit above that land, and then they move towards um, uh, the ocean where there's uh, the, the air here um, is 
much warmer. And so because the air is much warmer over the ocean, that creates low pressure systems over the ocean, high pressure systems over the continents, and then air masses move towards lower pressure systems. So that's in the wintertime. However, in the summertime, uh, it reverses. So because the continent itself is receiving so much more solar radiation, you start to develop lower pressure systems on land because the air masses that sit on top of land start uh, receiving a lot more solar radiation. And then the air masses uh, in comparison over the Indian Ocean are much cooler, so they form more often for higher pressure systems. So the wind direction changes and it moves in this direction, right? So it moves northward but is deflected to the right because of um, uh, the Coriolis effect. And so what that does is that brings a lot of moisture uh, to India and Southeast Asia. Moisture from all the evaporated water because of the really hot summer months near the tropics brings a lot of moisture and a lot of rain to India and Southeast Asia during the summer months. And then it brings a lot of uh, dry, cool mountain air through India during the winter months. Um, and so this periodically, this shift in the winds also shifts the ocean circulation. So if you notice um, in the winter time, when you have these kind of uh, south uh, westerly winds, the ocean circul the ocean uh, currents move in this direction, right? Um, but then when the winds change, then the the North Atlantic uh, ocean current moves in the opposite direction as a result. So that's a, an interesting ocean circulation uh, example here in, in, in the Indian Ocean. And because of this, then that means there's also changes in the uh, productivity of the ocean itself because of upwelling. So here during the uh, winter months, um, there's very low productivity off the coast of uh, yeah, I guess it's that uh, Oman, Yemen. Um, and that's because of uh, the, the direction of the, uh, of the monsoon winds during the winter, kind of move in that direction. But if we have uh, the, the warm winds moving over the coast of India, moving a lot of uh, moisture in that direction, that creates, creates coastal upwelling along the coastline here. And then there's a lot of uh, productivity as a result. All right, let's talk about the Pacific Ocean circulation. Um, here, the North Pacific subtropical gyre is bounded by these currents. We've talked about the Kushiro Japanese Western Boundary Current, and there's a North Pacific California Eastern Boundary Current, the North Equatorial Current, and the Alaskan Current. And then the Southern uh, Pacific subtropical gyre, we have the East Australian Current, which we talked about it. Uh, it shows up in that movie Finding Nemo, right? They ride that fast current. It's a western boundary current. That's why it's so fast. Um, then there's the eastern boundary Peru current. And then these are all the currents that surround the rest of the subtropical gyre. Here's an image of it. Here's the East Australian current, man. Take it. OK. And then here's the eastern boundary current, Peru current. Here's the eastern boundary California current. And they uh, rotate in opposite directions because they're in different hemispheres. In the Pacific Ocean Basin, um, so the Indian Ocean has it. Indian Ocean Basin has the monsoon winds that makes it unique. But the, the Pacific Ocean Basin has uh, a phenomenon uh, that's very interesting. And, and part of the reason is, is because the Pacific Ocean is so big. Um, they have this uh, oscillation uh, weather phenomenon called uh, El Nino La Nina. And what it is essentially is um, the Walker circulation cell which is a big atmospheric circulation cell above the Pacific Ocean Basin. So under normal conditions, the air pressure across the Pacific is higher in the Eastern Pacific, meaning that it's higher uh, off the coast of South America and lower closer to Australia. And so what you have are really strong Southeast trade winds. Okay, so they blow essentially from South America over the uh, Pacific Ocean Basin towards the other side of the um, Pacific Ocean Basin. Um, and that pushes a big pool of warm water, a Pacific warm pool of water, on the western side of the ocean. Okay, so that's typical. The thermocline, meaning that kind of uh, that rapidly changing 
um, temperature uh, um, and changing density, uh, that, that layer on the western side of the ocean basin is much deeper. And you get a lot of upwelling and cool, nutrient-rich waters on the coast of Peru. So this is under normal conditions. This is the Walker circulation cell, low pressure system here, right? So warmer waters, lots of rain, okay? And on this side of the Pacific Ocean Basin, you have a high pressure system. Cooler air kind of falls down on the coast of South America, okay? And then these are the trade winds that blow that all that ocean water westward. And then so you have a lot of piling up of warm water in this, in this area over here. So that warm water uh, creates the surface water uh, is very thick. This is not to scale, but just, just to show you that warm water is very thick. And the thermocline is very deep as a result of that, that portion of the ocean, like an ocean layer. Um, but as you go c closer to the South American continent, the thermocline gets closer to the surface or and, and the surface waters are very thin over here. And that's because of that uh, water being pushed in this direction. And that causes a lot of upwelling off the coast of Peru and northern Chile. And so under normal conditions, this causes a lot of biological productivity off the coast of Peru. And it's one of the best fishing spots in the world. That's where a lot of Peruvian culture is centered around food uh, that comes from the ocean. And they export a lot of their catch to the rest of the world because of the high productivity that occurs here under normal conditions. But this changes. Um, El Nino, or Southern Oscillation, El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, as, uh, or ENZO, this is when that Walker cell, atmospheric cell circulation, is disrupted. Now, it isn't known exactly why this occurs. Um, we're still kind of, scientists are still trying to grapple with the specific reasons for this. But essentially what happens is a high pressure system in the Eastern Pacific weakens. That's over uh, kind of Peru. Uh, that causes weaker trade winds. And then instead of pushing all that warm tropical water towards the western side of the ocean basin, it kind of migrates, that warm water migrates eastward as a result. And so the thermocline deepens in the eastern Pacific, and you get a lot of downwelling. So what was once an area of great uh, biological productivity is now lower in biological productivities, and Peruvian fishing suffers greatly. And the reason why uh, it came up with, or the reason why it's called El Nino is because Peruvian fishermen uh, first noticed this kind of warm water coming from the west towards Peru. And it typically occurs during the no late November, early December. And so they called it El Nino, which is like a reference to Jesus because it's in December. So El Nino means the boy, okay? Um, so that's where the name comes from. So here's under uh, El Nino conditions in the Eastern Pacific. So now we have a lower pressure system uh, towards South America and now a higher pressure system in Australia. And so uh, a lot of people in South America, especially in those areas of uh, Peru and Northern Chile, call those years that this typically happens, years of abundance because they're, you know, they're farming. And so if you have a lot of rain in those areas, then you would scrape for crop yields. But fishing suffered. And the reason why is because there's no more upwelling. And so the thermocline, um, is um, much deeper than it normally is. And on the eastern side of uh, the Pacific, here instead you have high pressure systems, which is different from when they're used to. That means they have a lot less rain, more drought, and cooler weather. So here's a satellite image of uh, El Nino conditions in the Pacific Ocean. And what you need to focus on here is, if you look down here, it says sea surface temperature anomaly. So that essentially means the temperature of the sea surface away from the normal. So blue would mean colder than normal, and over here red would be warmer than normal. And so what happens is during an El Nino, that warm western Pacific current moves in this direction, which is, which is not normal, and it leaves a lot of warm water pooling up on the um, eastern side of the Pacific. And so what this does is causes coastal downwelling, kills fishing, a lot of low pressure systems here, a lot of rain. Sea level actually rises as a result of this um, uh, as much as eight inches. Uh, and that affects really low lying countries like Panama, 
um, coastal areas with uh, rising sea level, that can affect them during El Nino years. Um, and so there's this huge mass of warm water that uh, anomalously warm water that is stagnating kind of over in the eastern Pacific. So that's El Nino. That's what El Nino is. It's kind of an oscillation from the norm and all this warm water kind of moves uh, uh, towards the, the eastern part of the ocean basin. Now on the other side, when, when the weather pendulum swings back the other direction, we call that La Nina. And that's the cool phase. And so here, it's almost like um, uh, like as if the conditions return to normal, but much higher than normal. So what you get is uh, increased pressure difference across that equatorial Pacific. So stronger trade winds, uh, stronger upwelling in the eastern Pacific, so great for fishing, right? More biological activity. A very shallow thermocline in the eastern Pacific cooler than normal seawater in the eastern Pacific and warmer than normal seawater in the western Pacific. And then, yeah, with that is all high biological activity. So here's the, the La Nina conditions. So you get, uh, again, return to high pressure systems on this side, but even greater. So stronger trade winds blowing more warm water into the western Pacific, western Pacific. So you have huge lower pressure system here, uh, more rain, uh, possibly a lot of funny uh, flooding, uh, really dry conditions uh, on, in the eastern Pacific. And the warm water just kind of all kind of pushed uh, westward. And so there's a lot more upwelling in the eastern Pacific. <coughs> and then here's another satellite image showing you sea surface temperature. And again, it's sea surface temperature anomaly. So what you notice is on the in the western Pacific, it's much warmer than normal. And that's because the stronger trade winds are blowing all that warm water in this direction. And then uh, in the eastern Pacific and the equator uh, in the equatorial latitudes of the Pacific, it's much colder than normal. So though that is the kind of back and forth swinging of the um, uh, equatorial Pacific and uh, Enzo conditions. Okay, El Nino warm phase, uh, that occurs about every two to 10 years. It's very irregular. Scientists are trying to figure this out because it's really good information to know because then you can let farmers know in the Western Pacific or in the Eastern Pacific what to expect in terms of the amount of rain they're gonna get or fisheries, uh, whether or not there's gonna be a lot of upwelling and high biological productivity. But it's, so, but it's very irregular and we don't really know exactly uh, exactly why it occurs. We have uh, some hypotheses, but um, these phases usually last between 18 and 12 months, 12 to 18 months. So when we're under an El Nino phase, we could expect that type of changes in the Pacific for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, there is a sediment record, uh, a 10,000 year sediment record of these events. So we can go back into our past before satellite data and understand how often do these events occur. And what scientists are realizing is that the ENSO kind of uh, back and forth um, weather changes might be actually part of a larger kind of cyclical phase in the Pacific Ocean called the decadal oscillation or PDO. Those are longer term natural climate cycles and they actually last 20 to 30 years. So that's a, a funny thing about science is when you start kind of digging a little deeper and collecting more data, you find out that the world is a little more complex than you initially imagined. Um, but here, if we look here, this is since 1950 to about uh, 2018, um, the uh, back and forth nature of uh, the cool Enzo phase or La Nina and the warmer Enzo phase like El Nino. So there've been some pretty hard hit El Nino years uh, here in the uh, in maybe 83 um, and then 97 and then more recently in 2015, uh, some really strong El Nino years. And there are a lot of global impacts uh, to this. Um, when we have El Nino years, uh, we have um, increased rain and flooding and sea level rise and decreased fishing all in these areas. 
Okay, the Galapagos Islands are in these areas when they have increased sea level that affects them greatly and all the organisms that live there. Um, on this side, we have uh, during El Nino years, high pressure systems on the, on the uh, Western Pacific. So they experience drought, fires as a result of this, um, cooler ocean uh, waters um, uh, on this part of the, uh, the reefs on the, in the Western Pacific may suffer as a result of from that. Um, uh, consequently, in La Nina years, then you have the opposite effect. Um, you have more rain in the Western Pacific, which means a lot of uh, uh, flooding and stuff like that. And on the Eastern Pacific, you have a higher, less rain, so it's worse for farmers. Better fishing, um, but more dry weather. Um, and lower sea surface levels over here. So um, there are a lot of uh, global impacts as a result of this kind of oscillation of climate. Okay, so there's some notable uh, ENSO events like I talked about, 82 to 83. Uh, these were in 97, 98 were uh, extreme El Nino events, a lot of flooding, drought, erosion, fires, tropical storms, and uh, harmful marine effects uh, as a result of those El Nino events. Uh, consequently, in Florida, actually, when, whenever there's an El Nino uh, phase, um, the jet stream kind of moves, to, uh, kind of curves a little further south, and that actually has the tendency to push hurricanes out into the northern Pacific. So during an El Nino year, actually, um, we have a, a smaller chance of being hit by a hurricane during hurricane season, um, but doesn't mean we're, you know, free and clear. Um, Andrew, one of the most uh, destructive hurricanes and uh, that to make landfall in Florida occurred in El Nino year. So, but the risk is lowered during those times. Um, here's the sea, sea surface temperatures during El Nino and La Nina uh, in North America. So uh, this is sea surface temperature anomalies during El Nino. So uh, along the west coast of North America, it's much warmer than normal. And on uh, this, during La Nina, it's much colder than normal. So these are drastic changes in, in those uh, areas. Um, how do we predict this stuff? Well, there's the Tropical Ocean Global Atmospheric or TOGA program started in 1985. They monitor the equatorial Pacific and they have a system of buoys all across the Pacific so they can track that uh, warm water coming from the Western Pacific as it approaches uh, South America and then potentially predict the next El Nino event. Then there's the TOA, the Tropical Atmosphere and Ocean Project, that continues to monitor the, uh, the circulation cell across the Pacific. And again, what's critical here is that it's not fully understood. Uh, scientists being able to predict what will happen next is not a guarantee. They're still studying this and collecting data and conducting research. Okay, and finally, there are deep ocean cur currents. We call this thermohaline circulation. This is uh, masses of ocean water that are driven by differences in temperature and density in, in ocean water. This occurs below the peak nocline. And in fact, it's most of the ocean water. 90% of the ocean water uh, uh, circulates because of deep ocean currents. And they move very slowly in comparison to surface currents. So essentially, this three-dimensional circulation as water sinks or rises originates in really high latitudes on the surface of the ocean. So what happens is when water gets up to these latitudes, it gets colder. And now it's because it's colder, it's more dense. And because it's more dense, it begins to sink. And as it sinks, um, it starts or initiates that three-dimensional thermal haline circulation. And the different uh, water masses that we run into, uh, we identify them on a TS diagram, that's temperature salinity diagram. And what that does is identify different bodies of water based on their differences, small differences in temperature and density, which results, I'm sorry, temperature and salinity, which results in differences in density. So this is how you read it. This is uh, temperature on the y-axis, okay, degrees centigrade. Okay, here from zero to 20. Here's salinity in parts per thousand on the x-axis, right? 33 parts per thousand to 36 parts per thousand. And what you see contoured here in these blue lines, this is the density, right? So lower density 
uh, over here and then higher density over here, which makes sense, right? Because saltier water will be more dense and down here would be colder water. So cold and salty would be the densest and warmer and less salty would be the least dense, okay? And then these uh, areas here with these um, uh, letters uh, denote different water masses that we find in our ocean. So for example, AAIW stands for Antarctic Intermediate Water. And so Antarctic Intermediate Water has uh, salinity and temperature variations that, that all fall within this box here. So that is the definition of that type of water. Okay. NACSW is North Atlantic Central Surface Water. Okay, so they kind of have a wide range of salinity because it's a big area and a kind of a, a smaller range in temperature. NADW is North Atlantic bottom, uh, Deep Water. AABW is Antarctic Bottom Water. This is some of the most dense water in our ocean. Okay, Antarctic Bottom Water, coldest and saltiest. Okay, or oh, one of the saltiest. But here, the MIW, the um, Mediterranean Intermediate Water, is some of the uh, salt, the saltiest water uh, on Earth. A lot of evaporation that occurs there. So, here's a cross section of um, portions of the ocean basin showing you that three-dimensional circulation. Okay, remember when we looked at a cross section? There's that surface mixed layer here. Then there's the thermocline and big Pycnocline below that, and these are found in low to mid latitudes. Okay, but once you get to the northern latitudes, so this is the, uh, closer to the northern pole, so close to Greenland, and here's the southern pole and close to Antarctica. These are isothermal waters, so it's very cold at the surface. Okay, so this cold water gets really cold and dense and sinks, and so this is the North Atlantic deep water. Uh, all this water here has similar temperature and density, so it kind of doesn't really mix with other waters. It just kind of moves into different spots based on its density. And then in the Antarctic waters, this water is even colder and denser, so it sinks below the North Atlantic deep water, and that's the Antarctic bottom water. So here you can see the cross section from Greenland to Antarctica. This is the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And if we zoom into Antarctica, here's uh, assuming like the landmass here, we have Antarctic bottom water sinking down over here. And here's the North Atlantic deep water, right? Here's that North Atlantic deep water, and it actually comes up towards the surface uh, during that um, Antarctic convergence. That deep water comes up towards the surface. And then here's the Antarctic uh, intermediate water sinking beneath the uh, um, water at lower latitudes here. So this is how water kind of circulates in a three-dimensional fashion uh, in the deep ocean. So here are some of those deep water masses we talked about. Antarctic bottom water, North Atlantic deep water, Antarctic intermediate water, and ocean common water. Okay. So cold surface water sinks at polar regions and then moves towards the equator. That's the general rule. And so these areas in purple are the areas where cold surface water sinks, and that initiates that three-dimensional circulation. So in an area that sinks, it sinks and then goes towards the equator, comes down below the warm, shallow surface currents, and then can pop up in different areas. But this is the uh, circulation. Um, on average, they think the entire kind of three-dimensional loop from deep water coming up towards the surface and surface water sinking can take about a 1,000 years. So it's a kind of conveyor belt of circulation. And then finally, um, because ocean water masses move, um, it can carry a lot of energy uh, as that wo those water masses are moving, and that actually carries more energy than winds. The Florida Gulf Stream is the fastest mass of moving water uh, on the Earth and moves the largest volume of water. And so if we have underwater turbines, that could be a potential area where we could generate a lot of renewable electricity, which would be a good thing. But... Uh, power from these currents. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, they're difficult to maintain. Uh, they're way out into the water. They can break down. They're hazard to some marine life and they're hazard, hazards to potential hazards to boating. So and it's very expensive. So we don't uh, use them as much. Uh, but there's a lot of potential 
in harvesting the energy from moving masses of water in the ocean.